This is the PlayStation 2. It's my favourite console of all time and having had one since 2002, I know quite a lot about it. However, in the modern era, there's one slight problem. This. This is the AV multi output. Basically, that's where you put old cables into a television that used to accept analog cables. The question I get all the time is, how can I get the best out of the PlayStation 2? And I'll try to answer some video misconceptions about it that we get a lot, and I mean a lot. So let's talk about it. Hello and welcome back. So the misconceptions about the PlayStation 2 video output is varied and there's a lot of questions that people ask me all the time in my old videos covering the subject. I'll talk you through all the ones that I know best, give you some tidbits here and there, and hopefully when this video is over, you'll have a better idea at not only the best way to get the PS2 quality that you want potentially, but also just some misconceptions that I would like to answer. For those of you who don't know, the PlayStation 2 came out way back in the year 2000. I was seven years old at that time and the world was very different. Although the internet existed, it was not the internet we know today. Smartphones definitely did not exist, although mobile devices did exist and start to have internet in uh, connectivity with them. But most importantly, the displays that we used were all CRTs. Now, yes, in the year 2000, the plasma TVs came out and they were the first flat screen type TVs. But let's just say there's a reason why plasma didn't stay around very long. This thing worked with CRTs the best and most of us used the cables that came with, that's right, the composite cable, known as the yellow wire. This came with every PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, and I believe for a time, the PlayStation 3 as well, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, the yellow wire cable is a common cable, and we all had it at some stage or another. Compared to the RF cable, which was also available, and I did use once or twice, Composite was a good upgrade. When it comes to the four types of cables that we most know for Sony systems besides RF, we have Composite, aka the yellow wire, S-Video, which is more popular in North America and not so much here in the UK, the SCART cable or RGB SCART cable if it was a good one, and then of course a new addition to the PlayStation line, Component, which was the five wire. You had two red wires, a blue, a green, and I believe white, let me think, hang on, green, blue, white, yeah, and two reds, there we go. You see, I remember that correctly. So anyway, they're the four major cables. So where should we start with the misconceptions of PS2 video output? Let's start with the composite cable then. So it was a standard cable with all PlayStation 2s. It could output 240p or 288p for power versions, 40i, or 576i for power, for power versions, and that's it. Most PlayStation 2 games will output in 480i or 576i, which is an interlaced video output, which means two different fields made up a big image. And of course, it had to be deinterlaced. Now, CRTs did this basically on their own. If you're playing these things on a HD uh, television, you have to deinterlace the footage. And although most televisions have built in deinterlacers, most of them aren't very good. Composite is blurry, doesn't look that great, and it's just icky. It, it looks like a blur filter has been applied to your, to your footage, basically. Again, on a CRT, where most people would have played the, P, the PS2 back in the day, composite was acceptable, and still is today, if you play on a CRT. Most of us, myself included, play on HD, uh, MI, well, HD TVs, or, in my case, a 4K TV, and composite therefore is inadequate. And that's why most people hate the video quality of PS2. It's bad enough that you have the, the, the interlacing problem, but then you combine that with a low quality cable and it just adds to the problem along with a big HD TV. That's one cable. How about S-Video? Again, S-Video was not common in the UK, but in North America, it was a good upgrade over the composite cables. I don't quite know how it works. There are better channels that will, that will explain it better than me. But essentially, S-Video separates the chroma and the other colors se information separately compared to composite. And therefore, it allows for a cleaner signal. You're still limited to 240p or 288p or 480i or 576i. But it'll be like the blur filter has been removed 
compared to composite so therefore if you want better video quality for a good price you can get an s video cable i think you can buy some in this country for about 10 pounds for a decent cable the one i've got is a sony official and it looks very good and then we come to rgb scart cables and rgb scart cables on ps2 are very interesting much like s video you'll get better image quality compared to composite and it will look even better than RG than, um, than s video not not by a whole lot for most games but it will definitely look a little bit crisper and there'll be a bit more definition to the picture on the playstation 2 and this works on all playstation 2s by the way rgb scar cables can also enable 480p progressive scan support and that means that the image instead of being two separate fields that have to come together the picture will be scanned in one go a e progressive scan so the image will look a lot better and 480p has slightly more pixels than 480i or 576i so it's great for getting the best out of the ps2 for the games that support that resolution natively and yes the power ps2 is the same the only problem is with rgb scart is if you want to use 480p with it you have to have a device a display or an upscaler that can enable the rgsb mode because the ps2 works with rgsb when using rgb scart in 480p if you don't you'll either get a really fuzzy picture or the picture will just be black you have to be very careful when using rgb scart when trying to play 40p games but it does work and rgb scar is cheaper than our next choice of cable which is component most people assume that component is either on par with rgb scar or worse and of course the only way to get 40p on the playstation 2 component can look very similar or the same as rgb scar and it will also allow for 40p uh, progressive progressive scan support although admittedly component is easier to get 40p versus RGB SCART because RGB SCART needs a device or monitor that supports RGSB, whereas Component just works. If your device supports Component and 40p video, it will just work. So Component is the easiest, however, it's also the most expensive cable. I think a good Component cable can cost two times more than a good RGB SCART cable, at least here in the UK. It could be different everywhere else, if, especially if component was more commonplace. But here in this country, a good component cable for the PlayStation 2 is twice the price of an RGB SCART cable. So if you can go RGB SCART, go with that cable. In terms of RGB versus component, as I said earlier, as long as both cables are good, both can look the same. And actually, component is a bit better because on the PlayStation 2, if you have RGB SCART cables, they've got to be a ps2 specific one to get the best out of the image if you've got a cable like my one which is more for ps1 it will still look good it will still work but it won't look as good as a decent third party or official sony official component cable the other thing about the playstation 2 is it has a mode on the com uh, on the console itself where you can go between rgb and component if you use composite s video or rgb all cables will work with rgb if you hit component, S video and composite will still work, but RGB will go green and component. Well, if you try and use a, a SCART, if you try to use a uh, a component cable when it's in RGB mode, the picture will, will go black. Basically, the component signal won't be seen if you put it onto RGB mode. So therefore, if you get a PS2 and you use component cables and you think the console doesn't work, either plug in a RGB cable a SCART cable that is, a component, ca a composite cable or S video and the picture will show back up or you have to blindly go to system uh, configuration, get to the analog output mode, change it to com uh, component and the picture will show right back up. So no, if your PS2 doesn't show up with components straight away, it's not broken, it might just be on RGB mode and not components. So bear this in mind. As I alluded to earlier, all PS2s can use 480p. Unfortunately for the power systems, not all games that had 480p made it over to the UK or any other European country. So for example, Gran Turismo 4, that game had 480p and 1080i high definition mode on all NTSC versions. Unfortunately, our version of Gran Turismo 4 only came with 576i only, the native 576i 50hz mode. So we never got 480p 
and we never got 1080i mode. Unfortunately, there's quite a few games in the PS2 catalog that although we got it, we got it, we didn't get the same video output. So if you're playing a game on the PAL system, check online to see if that game came with 480p. If you want to know how to access 480p, there's several ways to do it. In some games, the game will ask you before the actual game begins. So Tekken 4, for example, is a good one where before the game starts, a splash screen will come up and it will ask you if you want uh, 40, uh, for, sorry, if it wants uh, standard PAL, uh, 40i, so PAL 60, or 480p progressive scan, and you can choose at the menu. Uh, in other games, some of them will, you can find in the options menu, such as Shadow of the Colossus, where you go to the options and the, and the progressive scan mode is there. Or in other games, you have to hold the X and triangle buttons as the PS2 splash screen appears and you have to hold it until the game asks you if you want to use standard resolution output or 480p output. So if you're not sure if your game supports 480p, try one of the three options before playing the game and see what happens. Also, as a tidbit, if you're a power user like me, some of these uh, options allow you to access a hidden 60Hz mode. Yes, some games that we play in the power region may have a hidden 60 hertz mode if you try to engage the progressive scan mode that I just told you. So it might be worth trying it anyway just to see if the power version of a game has 60 hertz support. Another aspect of PS2 video is interlacing. I've already mentioned that the PS2 uses uh, 576i or 480i for, its, for most of its output which is standard uh, definition output. And then of course 480p is enhanced definition officially. I will just say when it comes to deinterlacing, this is where things get tricky because if you're using a CRT TV, most of the time it will deinterlace the image perfectly fine, no problem. When it comes to modern displays, you may need to assist it. Most TVs have a built-in deinterlacer of some kind, but the kind of deinterlacer they use varies. Some have the blend type, some have motion adaptive, some use Bob deinterlacing, some use blend, some use weave, which is basically no deinterlacing, which is basically going to be uh, combing Artifact City if anything in your game moves. So if your TV doesn't do a good job of deinterlacing, which most do not, you have to buy an upscaler and there's plenty of upscalers out there. Ideally, you want ones that you can either choose to deinterlace yourself if you put the um, this footage through a computer like a MacBook or a desktop PC, or if you're going to use your TV, Ideally, you want it to use Bob deinterlacing or motion adaptive deinterlacing. Motion adaptive is the best one because it allows you to deinterlace as the image is moving. Unfortunately, you can still get the occasional artifact or coming artifacts if the image is moving too quick for the deinterlacer, but that one is the preferred way to play most, sister, most games on the PS2. Bob deinterlacing is good as well because it's fast and it also means that input delay will be minimal compared to motion adaptive but still the image won't look as good and it will flicker a lot which many people don't seem to like very much but it's one of the few ways to get the best looking image on the PS2 on a HDMI display and speaking of HDMI displays I've also got to note that when it comes to putting images through them ideally you want them to be progressive that way the TV itself will then scale the image much better than if it was interlaced in the first place and of course, being that many PS2 games only support interlaced modes, it's a problem. Again, upscales can alleviate the problem. If you can find a good deinterlacer, which I know there was plenty way back in the day, although I've never used them, so good luck finding those. They're worth a shout as well. And also, don't forget as well, there's another way you can boost the, uh, the um, resolution of PS2 games, and that is Fremic Boot. It's a little piece of software that lives on a memory card that you can obviously make yourself or buy off eBay or Amazon. And you can go to the GS mode selector and you can force resolution outputs from all the way from standard all the way up to even 1080p in some cases. Although I don't recommend 1080p, but 1080i is there as well. I don't quite understand how it works. I don't know if it changes the way images are deinterlaced or something, but in some cases, you can enhance the resolution of games that don't natively support the progressive scan mode. Uh, Guilty Gear X2 is a good example, as you'll see here. There are other games as well that can get benefits, even if the game already supports 480p progressive scan mode, you can enhance it even further. 
But bear in mind, this is not a solution for everyone. Not all games will work properly. Some games won't boot. Some games will still look messy. And other games will just look better natively than they were trying to boost the resolution. It is a gamble, but it's, it's cheap to use. You can buy it easily off eBay. So therefore, I recommend trying it just to see if you can get better images out of the PlayStation 2. And of course, there's one other thing as well. Aspect ratio. So aspect ratios are important because PS2 games mostly were 4x3, but during the 6th generation of gaming, 16x9 widescreen became more common, and so there are two types of 16x9. There's the anamorphic, where the image is squished, and then you have to bring it out, and then the other one is letterboxing, where the game is uh, has two bars, top and bottom, and then you have to zoom in the image to make it work. Obviously, the letterboxed one can reduce detail when zoomed in compared to 4x3. And don't forget, even if a game uses 4x3, um, if a game supports um, 480p progressive uh, scan mode, you can still play the game in 4x3. If you play a game that's got a letterboxed widescreen, it's probably better to play it in 4x3 for the most detail. But if the 16x9 widescreen mode is anamorphic, definitely use that if you can take advantage of a widescreen display which I mean most displays are widescreen today so I don't think that's much of a problem in today's world. These are some of the things you can do with PS2 to make your image look as good as possible. Make sure that the cables you use are as good as they can be. You can buy a component cable, RGB SCART cable, S-Video or composite but if you buy a bad third party choice or an unbranded generic one the image will be very very bad compared to a real version of that same cable so make sure you shop wisely when looking for any reason or any uh, cable to upgrade from. Don't buy a cheap SCART cable thinking you'll get good quality. At best you'll get a decent image but it'll be noisy and full of artif artifacts, uh, visual artifacts or the sound quality will be balked and very very poor. You don't want that when playing retro games you want the best you can get. Obviously, I don't expect you guys to spend a ton of money, but you can go to certain places like Retro Gaming Cables and you can get SCART cables for a good price. You can get uh, component cables for a good price on eBay if you know what you're looking for. And if you can, try and use Google to see what reviews you can find for the cables in question because some third parties are worth looking at if they're of decent quality. Well, there you go, folks. That's just some tidbits about the PlayStation 2 video output and why some people have issues regarding how to get the best out of it. Of course, there's a lot more to the story than what I've said today, but these are the basics of what's going on. If you guys have any more to say on the subject, please let me know. And if you have any questions regarding what I've said today, or you just want me to answer a question that I didn't say in this video, let me know. But until then, I'll see you next time.